Hey guys, Binabu presents the MedTech podcast. If you're intrigued and want to learn more about how technology is changing healthcare, then this podcast is perfect for you. If you want to learn about entrepreneurship and innovation, then stick around. My name's Ash, and welcome to the conversation. Welcome back to the MedTech podcast. Before we get into this episode, I just wanted to remind you all, please, please hit that follow button. Hit the notification icon. It's that little bell. It just notifies you whenever I release a new episode. If you're listening on YouTube for the first time, hit the subscribe button. Give the episode a rating, like, and just share with as many friends as possible. It would just help the channel to grow. I'd really appreciate it. So I think as students, as medical students, specifically as clinicians, with talks of burnout rates being the highest ever and workload stress being extremely intense there will be points in our careers that we consider stepping out of medicine and we look at our peers we look at our non-medic friends who might have a city job who seems to be earning more money than us seem to be happier than us and seem to have a better work-life balance than us and we think to ourselves why don't we just do that I i mean me personally i've considered countless times now where medical school stress has just gotten too much and I've considered stepping out and maybe pursuing a different different career path but you know what actually listening to hear deal today reminded me why I'm grateful to still be in medicine and, and reminded me that you know what I am actually excited to graduate medical school and start practicing clinically the story she tells are extremely heartfelt she has invented a smart glove which is able to translate sign language into speech in real time and she tells the stories of the people's lives that this is effective she's effectively given a voice back to the voiceless so if you enjoyed this episode please just make sure you leave a review thank you so much guys really great to meet you hadil so i have an amazing guest joining with me today she is the cto and founder of an amazing amazing company and they built an ai driven smart glove which is the first in the world if i'm correct that translates any sign language into any spoken language and it allows sign languages to communicate directly to others without the assistance of an interpreter and it honestly it's just empowering the people who don't have their own voice who aren't able to communicate for themselves so it's really great to meet you Hadil why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners yes you got that all right the best introduction I've had so far <laughs> my name is Hadil and I'm the founder of Brighttime. Brighttime started as an academic project when I was doing a research and PhD at University of London. And during usability studies, I realized that actually there isn't an equivalent piece of tech in the market to solve a real problem. And so everybody who joined me on the testing rounds from students and councils expressed their desire to keep their units. And so I felt like maybe I should try myself at the entrepreneurship world and take this further into a commercial product. And that's what I've been doing in the last two years. Sure, really great. And I think communication is one of those things that is obviously taken for granted with everyone because we're just brought up doing it. When people have children, obviously they get excited with the first step, but then also the first word. And with communication, it's it's how we, how I guess we relate to people on a personal level. We get to know someone through communication. And so I think we take that for granted and when someone has a disability where they don't have the skills to communicate with someone effectively it almost isolates them and i love having done the research on what bright sign has been doing is the fact that i guess your proposition is your aim is to give a voice to those who can't speak which is really great so it'd be great to hear a bit about you first before we get into how bright sign was formed so Take me all the way back to your university days. you unlike most my guests don't actually have a clinical background a lot of the guests that come on are doctors but you're a bit different. Yeah, so I did a BA at, in design and I was really focused on digital design. So creating virtual spaces, having people experience different environments virtually before actually translating that into the physical world. And I became more focused on us humans moving within the space. How can I my movement so that I can interact in my virtual space? And so after I finished the BA, I decided to focus more on programming, but creative programming or programming for artists. So I didn't have to have a computer science degree for that. And I came to the UK actually, because that was one of the few universities that provided that kind of training. 
And once I finished my master's in programming, I became a bit more greedy and said, okay, I want to focus more on the hand. How can I translate my hands? Because I wanted to be able to create my own art and design pieces within 3D space. And I wanted the air to be my canvas. For PhD, I just focused on the hand. How can I translate my hands into the space and know what it's doing? But during that time, Goldsmith was putting together a team to send to IBM headquarters in South Korea. And it was for a hackathon to use a new software IBM was trialing. And it was to create some kind of product with artificial intelligence, but to serve a social problem. And because I spoke sign language and I was doing research on translating hand, I decided to translate, translate sign language to speech. And so I implemented their software, which was translation in general, to translate my hand movements and sign language to English and then to South Korean and different languages. And that just worked. And I yeah. won that competition. And the media coverage that they had really was the reason I continued in this area. Because all of a sudden, I came back to London five days later and I found that there are requests from my embassy. People are trying to get hold of me to tell me that they love. And a lot of speech therapists, a lot of families, emails from America, from Australia, from all over Europe saying, I have a kid that's nonverbal. How can I get my hands on a glove? And I'm like, okay, this was a one-off project. What am I going to do? Am I going to continue doing this? Am I going to continue doing virtual interaction with art? And that wasn't an easy choice because I was already six months into my PhD. But then I woke up one day and I got a video from a mother. And her son was signing on the overground. And the people weren't understanding him. And she said, if you give me a glove, he can now go out on his own. And that was it. That was the decision-making point for me, which is I'm going to dedicate three years of PhD research into developing this from a one-off project to actually something usable and durable enough for people to use it for everyday communication. That's how I started in design and ended up in um, sure. fun language translation. The healthcare angle came a little bit after that when I implemented AI, to allow the glove to learn from each user their own unique hand movement, which meant that it can now be used for any condition where a voice was lost for a limited time if they are like intubated or if they are older and they had a stroke and don't know sign language and then their hand movements are very limited. It means they can use whatever mobility they're able to perform some signs to communicate, even if they've made it up. It also means that older people who just lost the ability to speak also can create their own sign don't have to be sign language or a specific sign language. It could be any gesture that they remember to communicate a certain need. That's how it just changed completely from just sign language to any healthcare innovation that requires sure. communication using the hand. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So initially, it wasn't the fact you were focusing on building a product for specifically to help out people who were hard of hearing, but to help translate sign language into, into speech. It was a fact that it came about from a hackathon. And so yes. I know Bright Sun Glove has won multiple awards. And so how have those awards helped your business? You've alluded to, you've alluded to obviously gaining that recognition and getting people to message you in your inbox. And then also the mother obviously sent you that video. So in terms of progressing your business, would you say that's been an accelerator in driving it forward? Yeah, absolutely. Being a student, I mean, there's a lot of competitions open to me because a lot of businesses or councils or government entities want to support and encourage students with bright ideas to commercialize or try themselves in the industry. And so I just applied to every competition that was available for students with innovative ideas. A lot of the awards came with huge media coverage, which created that noise about me and the product and the innovation, but also some of them came with free office space for a year, which means I have a place to go and work free access to a lab, which means I was able to innovate and develop my prototype. Some of them came with clinical studies attached to them because they had healthcare units. So they already had the patients or the students or access to people who are willing to test my product with all of the required regulation and ethics clearance that can take months to get. Some of them actually came with cash awards, which helped me buy mm. parts, bring on some more help to help me take this further. Some of them assigned me an intern every summer to help me yeah. do work on specific parts of my project. I think the first year I used it to develop smart textiles to embed the sensors with different designs. The second year okay. I used it for developing the application and software that comes with the glove. 
these are all skills that I don't have myself, but bringing someone yeah, on board yeah. to help me that is funded by a university, part of the award that I won was really helpful. Without that support, there is no way I would be where I am today. Yeah. And the only reason I mentioned that is because I, I'm quite passionate about, about hackathons. I think they're a great place to meet people, network and build your own personal professional skills. I, this opportunity of building this podcast and creating this podcast firstly arose from the MedTech National Hackathon. So I think it's interesting that obviously your idea initially came about from a hackathon. So definitely, yeah, any students out there listening, wanting to get involved in the MedTech space, I guess Hadil is fir first an example for you guys who are not sure where to begin with if you have an idea, ha not sure where to begin, not sure where to find a team a hackathon's a perfect place a person perfect environment to grow your solution grow your idea so yeah really inspirational her deal so it's interesting so you said initially you, you actually came to the uk so where did you come to, from the uk saudi arabia saudi and how was that transition moving from training in saudi arabia to now coming to the uk at the beginning it was very difficult i've never been to the uk before i moved here to study not even for sure. vacation or holiday it's a completely different culture I spent a lot of my teenage years in America, which is quite different than the UK yeah, as well. So there was a lot yeah. of learning about the culture, about the food, about public transport, about in time to get from in two places. But once you get into it, you appreciate, especially for mm. me, the support. People are here to help and there's open hands wherever you go. You just have to learn to reach out and you have to learn to knock on doors. Like the British Library, for example, just had an ad that said, do you need IP support? scan this QR code and I got an appointment with an expert in IP and patenting. Sat with them for an hour. They told me what to apply, what to do. And now I have three patents because of that one meeting. A lot of support available, literally everywhere. Yeah. And it's very rare to find that where I'm from. Support is not free ever. You have to be a member in something or a yeah, part of that organization in order to qualify for support. Whereas here, if you've got potential, they will help you achieve. Sure. Yeah. Really interesting, really great. And so I think it's perfect opportunity now to get on to bright sign, the bright sign glove that you guys have been working on for the past, how many years? Six, five, six years? More. So initially we're taught as students who are looking to get into medtech side of business, building your own company, building your own solution. You need to focus on the problem first. So let's break down the problem that you initially realized that led to you now developing bright side. Yeah. When I, when I got that video and realized that there's a lot of people who can't speak and actually a lot of people who don't understand them signing, that's a real, very clear communication problem. And I wanted to see the size of that problem. And then I looked at the numbers and it was 200 a million, 230 million people around the world who are nonverbal due to wow. various disabilities or combination of disabilities. And only 2% of them have access to sign language education or assistive technology that helps them communicate. So that's the size of the problem. Now, the sure, second wow. part of the problem is why can only 2% of the 230 million people can access assistive technology for communication? And it turned out that there are three primary reasons why they can't access technology. One was the cost. All of the technology for communication was basically very expensive. Starts at the £2,000 mark and counting. None of it is customizable to individual needs. Anybody who works in the disability world knows that disability comes in different combinations. So customizing the tech to individual needs is actually key for, the, for it to be useful. The third one is even the few attempts to create tech that helps with communication only solves one side of the communication problem. So I can use it to communicate, but I can't receive any feedback from the other side. That's how interpreters actually become very important because interpreters can solve the two-way of communication. However, there's a huge shortage of interpreters and usually family fall in that role. A family will always accompany someone who can't speak literally everywhere to help them communicate, interact, which means they can't become independent in making friends, relationships, can't really exist outside of their work environment, school environment, or home environment because they always need someone with them. And there's another layer of aligning your schedule with an interpreter schedule, right? If you have a business meeting, if you have a business trip and all of that. So I thought, okay, there is a problem and there is a shortage or a gap in the market for this kind of solution. How can I develop something that one is affordable? can be at least half of the cost of whatever's existing. Also complement the shortage in the interpreters and solve the two-way communication problem, but most importantly, customizable to individual needs so every person can teach it. Their old sign based on their own needs. That way there is no barrier. 
And that was sure. the whole, these were the three research questions in my PhD. And I started solving them one after the other. Some of them were hardware problems. Some of them were software problems. Some of them were design problems. So it was like a multidisciplinary research project yeah. really came into light once people started using it. Once I gave it mm. to people and said, come on, try using it. That's when the real problems were clear to me. And I spent the rest of the three years solving those problems. Yeah. And I think as a student doctor, you only start to appreciate how important communication is when you start practicing clinically, right? When you're with patients and you get a patient, you, you don't appreciate it till you get a patient who can't speak your language. And they're trying to communicate with you using, say, nonverbal gestures, their hands, and you just don't really understand what you're saying. And then there's a, and it takes like half an hour, 40 minutes for then you to get an interpreter to come, another 30 minutes plus, and then only then can you start having a consultation. And even then, when it's you have a consultation with an interpreter present, you're speaking through the, the interpreter and you go, don't get that feeling that it is almost a one-to-one -one conversation, a personal connection, because it your the communication is having to go through a third party to then go to the patient and then back and so what i really love about brightside is it is the fact it's addressing that barrier but specifically obviously not people who can't who speak a different language but with people who have disabilities which actually from no fault of their own they just aren't able to communicate and so it's really making a difference and helping people and giving a voice back of giving a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have it. And so I love how you, you identified that as a huge issue, as a huge problem, and you started developing the idea. And so take me through the process of now you've identified that as a problem. You've realized it's a huge problem and huge need for it. And you've given some statistics. You said 230 million people cannot speak due to whether it is they've been born like that or other conditions. And so what was the next step for you, having realized the huge need? Where did you go from next? The first thing I did is I reached out to special educational needs schools that are schools dedicated for students who have thick needs that cannot be integrated in mainstream schools. And I just had a meeting with a couple of them. There was a council that brought in 13 members of school, like 13 different school representatives to talk to me about the challenges the students face every day with their communication. And between them, they had so many different kinds of disabilities and spoke so many different languages of sign language. Sure. And so yeah. we talked about how can we develop a solution that helped them integrate easier in their environments with their peers and then potentially migrate to normal and mainstream classrooms so that then they can just be in normal mainstream schools and also just integrate more easily in their environments. There was another part that was basically qualifying them once they graduate from school, which is the higher age group, 15, 16, 17, so that then they can get a job with the help of that technology. So we were talking about the younger kids want to integrate into mainstream classrooms and the older kids that want to be released into the working market. And so together, we looked at what they're using. What they're using now was applications on their devices that put together some flashcards. And then they press play and that's what they want to say. And we said, we want something that is social, that helps interaction, that keeps eye contact and feels as close as possible to everyday verbal communication. And that it also needs to help them socially, give them independence, confidence, so that they form their own relationships. And that's how the glove idea came about. I put together some sensors. I wanted to know what exactly am I capturing? What do I need to understand from the hand? how is sign language structured? And so I put up a lot of sensors on a tiny little circuit and said, okay, I want to register all of that movement. Let me bring that back to the schools, give it to some students and have them play with it and see the result. And from that result came back and we're like, okay, let's fit it into an, a glove. Let's start adding buttons. Let's pair it with a, an application. Let's give them the option to register or record 10 signs and then 20 signs. And Let's give them a play with different voices so that the girls can have girl voices, the boys can have boy voices. And then let's give them different languages because a lot of the students actually were had two languages spoken at home. And so they had a language that they spoke at home, a language that they spoke at school. And slowly, bright lines started coming together as a tech. And then we started solving the other side of the conversation, which is transcribing incoming speech so that they can had two-way conversation. Yeah, two-way conversation, yeah. Yeah, and then at the end of the six-month mark, I sat with the parents and said, what did the glove enable your kids to do? 
not in school, outside of school, what happened? And that was very, it was such an eye opener to me. As you said, we take communication for granted. And so one of them said, my son was able to finally get his own haircut first time in his life oh, wow. without me telling the barber what he wants. And it was a completely different haircut from what I would have communicated. Mm -hmm. Another one said that he now is able and is allowed to go out completely on his own because the first thing they programmed into the glove was his address and the bus number and the bus route, which means wherever he is, he can sign the bus route and the bus number if he'd lost and he will be able to get home. And that was his parents' condition to allow him to go out on weekends on his own. And the younger kids were able to make friends completely on their own randomly in the park when they were out. And now they enhanced social skills. They are obviously happier to go out, don't have to pull in a brother or a sister to translate to, for them. In school, the teachers said they had a better academic performance just because of that boost in self-confidence where they don't have yeah. to ask someone to communicate for them. And then we had three of the older kids who qualified to move to mainstream schools to prepare them employment the year after, which for me was the absolute maximum achievement because it means that they are able to communicate enough on their own to move to another school and from there to get a job. And then we have to get we had to make bigger sized gloves for <laughs> the people who all of a sudden at the beginning of the trial had smaller yeah, hands yeah. and then at the end of the trial had bigger enough. hands. And we didn't <laughs> think about this, but that alerted us to get bigger, yeah. to make different sizes. And, stuff. and yeah. I think that confidence you, men you mentioned is rewarding to see initially. It came from giving these people the independence of being able to communicate. And w so you've obviously told these amazing stories. Was that a point where you saw this firsthand like being used in a real world scenario and you just thought, wow, like I've really, I'm really helping making a difference. Yeah. So all of the, all of um, the kids that use the gloves, the first sessions would be fitting them with the gloves, helping them understand how to teach it and it will be with their family. And so they always teach it at the beginning with me a first few signs so sure, that yeah, okay. we see if it works or not. Yeah, yeah. A lot of really heart, heartfelt moments. One of them was, she was four or five years old and apparently the mom just didn't language at all and the first thing that our, that the daughter did is sign i love you my mom to her mom and it, obviously everybody was crying but it was really nice to hear that some of them decided to program the glove to tell me thank you this is amazing and can't wait yeah. to wait it use it someone said the first thing i'm going to do is go get myself a mcdonald's and she made up the sign for mcdonald's because there isn't and she just did that <laughs> and that was mcdonald's it's really incredible if you think yeah, of it, that's it's, amazing. it's very simple but it made such a huge yeah. From my side, I think what I didn't see coming at the time is the glove being used for different scenarios where privacy was required and people refused to talk with an interpreter in the room. Sometimes the interpreter is the person the the nonverbal individual is trying to mm. talk about yeah, because yeah. If, there's, if it's their family and maybe they want to talk about that, they can. Or in the investigation or sure. at court or, as you said, in a clinic when they just don't want an interpreter in the room because they want to have that privacy with their doctor. In these situations, a lot of those schools had social workers that came to me and asked for units to be completely blank, left with them for cases when students come and want to talk and don't want an interpreter with them. Sure. Yeah. And so you've alluded on to also different iterations of the Bright Sign Club. I know before we, we started recording, I was telling you about how I was doing some research and w when Brightside first came about and I saw the first iteration, the first prototype that you were using and then seeing some videos that were recorded a bit more recently and how it's changed drastically. So it'll be interesting from a development point of view if you could break down the process of prototyping. Yeah. So in the beginning, I was doing everything myself in the lab. I just bought the component of one of the electronic shops and then a lot of trial and testing and burning parts and the circuit was pretty much a lot of components but a lot of wires connecting them to a circuit that I just put together. Eventually I had to refine it and make it smaller and more wearable and more durable because the first thing the kids do is pull on these wires. Yeah. It's fiddly, it looks attractive, it looks like an, a robot hand, everybody pulls wires so no gloves used to come back from testing intact. I have to spend a lot of time putting them back together. So I had to find a solution to encapsulate the circuit and to get rid of the wires and have everything on one circuit yeah. board and then everything like soldered on and encapsulate it. They can't reach it. I didn't have the skills for that. And so I found someone who was a, I think he was specialized in making circuits. And I just went to his lab. We sat together. I gave him my drawings and I said, can you put this all onto one board 
and no more wires, solder everything on. And he did that. And I paid for that from one of the grants, actually, that I won one of the competitions. And once I had that one nice, pretty, literally one piece of plastic that looked like a hand and all of the sensors and all of the computer chips were basically incorporated within that design. Yeah. I then went to a, what can I say, a custom print maker, I think is yeah, what yeah, they're yeah. called. And I brought that glove with the like circuit and I said, can we embed this into a design for a glove? Simple glove, simple design. I asked each of the children, what is their favorite character? And I sewed on, had a 3D printer and I created those on to pattern that I printed on the gloves. And that was the first gloves that actually went to families and they were able to use it for six months. When it came to commercializing, however, I couldn't take this into market because each of those gloves involved a lot of work from myself, from the circuit maker, from the custom pattern maker. And that was very expensive and it took a week to make. So I think at the time I applied to an accelerator that was dedicated for hardware projects. And part of that accelerator, they took us to China to look at manufacturing facilities. And the result of that trip was I can't manufacture in China from my side. I took my circuit, I tested it in every factory they took up to visit, and I didn't get durable or reliable readings to help me or make me feel confident that I can manufacture in China. Later that year, I was exhibiting at the wearable technology show. And the, the, we were like desks for small startup companies. Yeah. And the one exhibiting next to me was sensors, just with the same kind of sensors I'm using in my glove. And I said, can I use your sensors? And they're like, it's cheaper if we make the circuit for you. And they ended up being my commercial partner where I gave them the drawings and they are taking care of from A to Z, creating those circuits for me, embedding it in my own textile design, putting my branding on it and giving it back to me so that I can pair it with my app and then offer it. And so from there on, I stopped being a hardware startup and focused on software development, which actually oh. took the product to a whole other level and made me attractive for investors because investors don't like to pay money for research and development. That's what government grants are for. They like yeah. to pay money for something that the upfront cost is very low, like software, but then the scaling up is very high. And I only mm -hmm. became investable actually when I changed my approach and outsourced sure. manufacturing. But that was, yeah, over two or three years, it wasn't a very easy or speedy process. Before we get into the transition of the company, taking more of a software approach. And I guess that's where you started incorporating AI tools into the software, into the glove. Before we get into that, it'd be interesting to hear from your perspective, developing the glove in the early stages, how important it was for, to protect the IP of the glove and your challenges that you faced in obtaining a patent, stuff like that. Yeah. Writing a patent of this kind was very challenging because the, the, um, the technology exists for different applications. The smart gloves for gaming, the smart gloves for rehabilitation, for motion capture. So idea of a smart glove is not new. It's the application sure. and the design of the circuit and then incorporating AI. And the idea of having it translate gestures, custom gestures, that's where the IP really was. And so for me to frame that, I, I sat with a lot of IP experts. One of them was the British Library gentleman. I got some support from my university that was helping with IP as well until I was able to frame how I was going to approach this novel idea. And I feel like every time I applied for investment, they always asked if I protected my IP. So they care about development and where I am in the development cycle, but they care more about protecting the idea because they don't want to put their money on something that anyone else can make. So I was very aware of that right from the beginning and they went in parallel. I was working on the patent and at the same time I was working on development. And they actually came together at the same time. So while I was re being ready to launch the product, that's when we got the first notification that the, you know, the examiners in the patent office finally approved the final draft because of, there was a lot of back and forth and mm -hmm. that it was then being for uh, publication. And after publication, three months, I think, when no one complains about it, that's when it's granted. Sure. I think so anyone working on their medical device at the moment, what advice would you give them if they're looking to submit a pattern? I would advise them to try to do it themselves if they can, because I found it very expensive to have a firm do it for me. 
So in the beginning, I wrote all the documentation as much as I could on my own. And I did take benefit from all of the free services that different IP offices offer it, especially for students. There's a lot of free services for consultation and coaching. I only actually had to pay the fees for the filing, which you have to pay anyway. Eventually, when we did get funding, we did hire a firm to file subsequent pat patent and to file abroad as well. But if you can get away with it on your own in the beginning, do because protecting your idea is very important and it takes time. So from the date of submission, I only got it granted about, about two years later, but you get the protection from the date that you filed. So don't ever think that it's too early to file as soon as you possibly can. Sure. And what I really love about just talking to you today, Hadil, for the past half an hour so far, is it's evident from the start of your journey, there's been a strong emphasis on diversity and inclusivity, whether it is the fact you, from early on you incorporated different languages, or it's the fact you incorporate whether you're a female voice, a male voice, or different sizes of the glove, making sure it fits all people from all different sizes. And so how has that also impacted your journey in developing this, this product? Mm, it was vital because if you don't design something that is suitable for literally everyone, and there's no point doing it if you are operating in an accessible world. And my space is assistive technology. So that means I will get a variation, different conditions. And so if I can't cater to each and every one of them, I shouldn't exist in this space because half solutions don't really work. And so right from the beginning, I was focused on having it as flexible as possible in terms of different languages, different motor abilities, different pine language libraries, and even different applications. A lot of people wanted specific voices, not just voices that we preloaded onto the gloves. And so we also collaborated with another service that allows you to record bits and pieces of your voice, and then they'll synthesize that into a speech engine in a specific voice that could be your mother's voice or your brother's voice or whatever you want, because the voice is such a personal thing. And it is an extension of us. And if I don't have one, maybe I want some relative's voice that can be closer to mine. And I feel like the more we work in this space, the more we realize how personal what we're doing is and how much it needs to match the person or the individual that's using our tech. So being yeah. inclusive is what this is about, right? Yeah, definitely. I think it's probably one of the reasons you've also done so well is that strong emphasis on being inclusive for everyone because this is a global solution right you haven't just targeted even though obviously you developed it in the uk initially it wasn't something that you thought okay this could be used in the nhs solely it's something that you had the long-term vision of this being used and solving a problem globally which i really love and so we've spoken a bit about obviously bringing this product to market the prototyping stage you've gone through so now let's talk about what bright sun is doing at the moment in terms of the ai side so the AI application of BrightSign is allowing the glove to learn from each user. So the more they use it, the better it becomes in translating their signs. There is a calibration mode right in the beginning to teach the glove the boundaries of movement. That's each person's ability. How much range of movement can I do? That means it will only ever look within those boundaries. So it's more accurate and faster. Sure. It will always also know where you're, like if you're signing in a a specific vocabulary that it'll always look there first. It will identify that you're in a restaurant, so it'll always look in the food vocabulary, for example. There's a holiday mode if you're in a different country and want to switch the language to something else. All of these features basically was applications of AI that we were able to focus on once we finished commercializing the hardware. We are also doing a lot of fashion stuff. I came into the fashion idea quite late because I was, I'm a tech person. I was focusing on this from a tech perspective. But obviously it's a glove and it's a fashion piece. So people wanted to make it look like they wanted it to match what they're wearing. They wanted to personalize it based on their taste and also to identify the different gloves in places where they have a lot of them. So the idea of charms came about, just how to add different charms on the glove. So we created these Velcro patches and different charms that come as a package that reflect different characters, superheroes, whatever. And they try to make the glove feel more personal. So the AI was there initially to make it feel more personal, but now we've complemented that with physical yeah. stuff and fashion stuff to make it feel like it's mine and it represents me and my taste and my personality yeah. as well. Definitely. I really love that. Yeah. Just, I guess, stoop everyone's different needs in terms of how they'd want it to look like. I guess you, you probably have some kids, like some boys, maybe making it out like a Spider-Man glove or yeah. a superhero glove. And then you have some girls putting on embroidery, which is really great. I love that 
that that visible aspect of it now that you guys are working on so what is your future vision for Brightside? so if i if you were to i know this is obviously a very cliche question but if you were to teleport into the future in five let's say 10 years what is your vision I definitely want it to integrate with existing tech people use at home. So I want it to integrate with their phone, with their smarts, if they have an Alexa at home or something. So I want it to integrate in a way that it blends into their surroundings where they can control things in their home using those gloves. If they're using wheelchairs, they can control the wheelchair just using gestures in the glove. So basically integrate with their surroundings to make them more in control of whatever smart tech they're using already in their everyday lives. We are working on that. It's working because it signal it, it does yeah. work but there's some there's some things we need to test before that we want to make it lighter so maybe lose the sensors on the glove and just have a wristband so it's easier and it's not as obvious make it much more affordable as well because the most expensive components in the glove now are the sensors around the, the finger so having it lighter like a band will make it more affordable will make it less obvious will make it much easier to keep and store and use will make the battery last longer We'll make it also easier to integrate with existing tech. So inv like invisible tech for communication is really what I'm envisioning, envisioning sure. now. Um, yeah, I think what's really excited me about what you just said is the smart home aspect. So I'm quite tech savvy in terms of in my room. I have, like, I don't want to say Alexa's name because I'm scared she's going to go off. But so I, yeah, I have an Alexa in my room and then the Alexa is connected to all the different lights in my room, my Dyson fan, stuff like that. And so when I go to sleep, I'm like, oh, like, Alexa, turn off the bedroom and then all the lights go off. So it'd be amazing for, from a bright side perspective, it, if signed perspective, if you could integrate that into the future of a smart home in terms of it, the light yeah. systems, the temperature of the room, it, just everything like that. I can see that being, yeah, revolution, revolutionary that people are, that for people that aren't able to communicate through, through their voice. So really exciting. And in general, where do you see the wearable tech industry moving? How do you see it evolving into the future? I see wearable tech being used as an essential part, just like our phones was in the beginning, a luxury, it's now a necessity. I feel like wearable tech will become a necessity. A lot of people now cannot survive without their Fitbits or smartwatch or whatever. They're used to knowing how many steps they did every day. They're used to something monitoring their heart and their pressure and all of that. It's very similar because then you can get more feedback from the body to those smart techs that you're already using. It gives you a little bit more information about your training, your fitness, your sweat, whatever. If you're wearing yeah. a smart suit, I just, I can see that it will become an essential, just like everything else that was new and then became essential later on. Just part of us moving into a more, more smart world and being more mm. connected with our vital from a bioscience point of view. Yeah. And Hadil, it's been really amazing speaking to you. I think you're a huge inspiration to anyone out there who is looking in, in to get into the med tech health tech space, specifically from a student perspective, but also for anyone, whether you're a junior doctor or you come from a non-traditional healthcare background like yourself, you didn't necessarily tra train to do medicine, but you know what, you're, you're impacting the life of pa lives of patients. And so I know I, I initially reached out to you because you'd been, you were giving a talk for uh, the MedTech Society in UCL and the talk was themed around uh, women in MedTech. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to give some advice for any young girls out there who are aspiring to get into med tech and start their own business. I'd absolutely say if you have an idea, do pursue it and try it out. You, they, you will not fail because you will learn if it doesn't go right and then you can deviate or it will go right and you will learn some more as you're building it. Definitely give it a go. There is no dumb idea or not doable idea. A lot of people told me at the beginning of the glove, this is not doable. It's not doable. A lot of people tried and failed. Doesn't mean that it's not doable. It means that there is another way and those people didn't figure it out. I'd say that universities have huge support for new ideas and innovation in general. And healthcare innovation has unlimited budgets, just nowhere to tap on the different doors to get funding to support you just exploring your idea. I'd say that if the area you're looking at doesn't exist, doesn't mean it's not doable. It means no one tried it. So you can be the one to tackle it. And AI and technology can be incorporated in any practice. Healthcare is the best example, but really a lot of people are coming into tech and innovation from different backgrounds to complement their expertise. A lot of doctors I know have used AI and tech for diagnostics or simulation or therapy or improving mental health. 
So there is no limit and there is no, if your idea is crazy, that is the best kind of idea. Go for it and try it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. If your idea is crazy, that's yeah. the best kind of idea. And yeah, so I, I said, obviously give some inspirational words to any young girls out there, but in, in fact, actually I'm asking you to give some inspiration to anyone because you are a huge role model is the fact that you obviously came from Saudi Arabia, Arabia initially to the UK, had to get used to the and climatize the, the culture and then build your own solution in a new environment, scale that solution globally. So I think you're a huge role model to not only young girls and women, but just to everyone. So if anyone wants to re reach out to you, pick your brain, how, what's the best way they can get in contact and learn more about BrightSign and all the amazing things you're doing? They can email me. My personal email, hadilayub at gmail.com. They can visit my website and do the contact sheet. It comes to me and I can, I would usually reply. I do have a lot of one-to-one -one sessions with students like after a call like that. When I did the talk at UCL, a lot of students reached out to me that had ideas and didn't know how to approach it. I'm super happy giving my time to super excited students that want to try themselves in the world, do reach out. I will respond because I didn't have that kind of support for myself at the beginning when I first decided to explore this area. So I'm very happy now to be part of that network to help the next idea yeah. get yeah, into great. the world. And it's been amazing have you, having you on. Honestly, just your story is just amazing and it's inspirational, honestly. Hadil. Any last thoughts, any final call of action for our listeners? Just a key takeaway. I'd say that it is very normal for things you want to do to be very difficult. That, that, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It means you're doing it right. If it's easy, it's not challenging enough. And that means it's not worth it. So definitely expect a lot of hiccups and dead ends. All it means is that you have to change your approach. Doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. Sure. That's really great. And it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Same here. Thank you for having me.